Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome by this webinar, Innovating Agriculture, How Malaysia Could Become a High-Tech Agriculture Hub, jointly organized by Agri Malaysia and the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Netherlands Embassy in Malaysia. We will start the program in two minutes. Please take your time to read our introduction slides, the introduction on the speakers and our house rules. Thank you. definitely come back next year. It's a wonderful place where you can meet a lot of customers, find a lot of possibility to cooperate.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Innovating Agriculture, How Malaysia Could Become a High-Tech Agri-Hub Organized by the MDPC and the Embassy of uh, the Netherlands in Malaysia and Partners. So um, today, before uh, we carry on with the panel session, we would like to now take the opportunity to first invite the um, Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Excellency Ad Yacobi, to present his welcoming remarks. Good afternoon, Yang Berbahagia Dato Haji Zainal Asma, Secretary General of the Malaysian Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries. Our distinguished panelist speakers, Dr. Mahalet Chumi of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, Dr. Mohamed Dessa of the Malaysian Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries, and my good friend, Mr. Frederik Vosnaar of the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands, and to conclude, Mr. Damien Schwarzkachel of Sertel Netherlands. And of course, to all the ladies and gentlemen who are participating in this webinar with us. It is a great pleasure for me to be here at the inaugural launch of the webinar, Innovating Agriculture, How Malaysia Could Become a High-Tech Agriculture Hub. This is a timely topic as there are rising pressures on food production worldwide. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimated that we need 70% more food production to feed a global population of 9 billion by 2050, up from the 7 billion people that we have today. And we need to do so in an increasingly challenging environment. We have climate change that will impact the yields of agriculture. We also have many other factors, such as rapid urbanization, which means less land for agriculture as cities grow bigger, and a reducing workforce that is no longer so keen on the manual work of agriculture. In this context, it is therefore imperative that the farming industry reinvents itself through the use of technology and innovation. With new technology, such as sensors and remote monitoring systems, farmers can now grow under any condition. They can control the elements, be it light, air, oxygenation level, carbon dioxide levels, all these can be monitored. And this means that seasonal crops and those which are non-native to the local climate can be produced anywhere, all year round, independent of the weather. We are now looking at production of food in unprecedented ways. Technology is a key enabler for farm transformation. It is changing the nature of farming itself and attracting an entirely new generation of farmers people whom you do not traditionally associate with farmers. It is very likely that in the future, many of these new farms will resemble high-tech manufacturing facilities rather than the traditional idea of farms, which will be assisted by automation and robotics. If our farms can continue to take bold steps to innovate and to push the envelope, Malaysia will not only be able to strengthen their own food security, but also contribute to global food security by exporting food and farming technologies to help with other countries' food security needs. In conclusion, I hope that everyone, whether you are a farmer or an aspiring one, researcher or academic, can learn and share some ideas and perhaps spark more collaborations and innovation and hopefully create more innovation for all of us. By working together, we can continue to grow this sector. I hope you will have a fruitful and enriching time in this webinar. I thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I think my line dropped earlier. Thank you very much, Excellency, um, Excellency Art, for sharing your perspective and for, uh, well, officially officiating the webinar today, um, organized by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and one international exhibition, the organizer of Agri Malaysia, um, as, um, as supported by MC, uh, MDBC. 
So um, we have not heard from the ambassador on how Malaysia can eventually innovate and become one of the key producers um, of agriculture or even food producers of the world. But um, before we proceed uh, with you know, uh, listening to all our panelists today, allow me to also take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, five of our very esteemed speakers uh, who have agreed to take their time off from the very busy schedule to share their thoughts and experience with us. Uh, the first speaker of today um, would be the Secretary General of the Malaysian Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Haji Zainal Asmin bin um, Abu Saman. And then my our second uh, speaker will be uh, Dr. Mahalat Chumi Arujanan. She's the executive director of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center. Uh, third speaker will be Dr. Mohamed Desa bin Haji Hasim. He is the deputy director of the Crop Quality Control Division of the Department of Agriculture Malaysia, uh, followed by Mr. Frederick uh, Bosnar. He is a special envoy uh, to the Agro Business Development Unit of the Nature and Food Quality of the Netherlands Ministry of Agriculture. And last but not least, our very esteemed speaker from the corporate sector, Mr. Damien. He is the Business Development Director of one of the larger, uh, the, one of the largest agriculture company in the Netherlands, Serton. So, without further ado, um, I would like to uh, invite. Um, or share with you uh, the Secretary General's um, recorded speech as he sent his apologies and he will not be able to join us in person today. Uh, but however, before we go into the speech by the, minist by the Ministry of Agriculture uh, represented by the Secretary General, perhaps uh, one of the key topics that we'll, we would like to uh, talk more about today is that uh, referring to the speech by the ambassador earlier, he talked about how can the world actually nourish 9.8 billion people by 2050 through very sustainable practices while uh, providing economic opportunities in both rural and urban communities. I think this is uh, one of the key pain points that many countries and many uh, corporate sector are trying to address. As we all know that um, our food systems today are really falling far short of these goals. Uh, food systems or food systems today that we see somehow do not currently provide nutritious food in, an, in a very environmentally sustainable way to the world population. As we all know today, as of today, nearly 800 million people are undernourished while 2 billion are micronutrient deficient and 2 billion more people are somehow overweight or obese. So therefore, at the same time, Food production, transportation, processing, and waste are putting unsustainable strain on environmental resources. And we will all be addressing and talking about all these pinpoints and perhaps also opportunities of how uh, by innovating technology, innovating agriculture, we will be able to overcome, uh, if not some, uh, I mean, if not more, but some of these challenges that we are facing today. So without more ado, uh, I would like to first invite the Secretary General of the Ministry of um, Agriculture and Food Industries, Malaysia, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you, Ms. Ng Yi Sin, the moderator for today's session, respected speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to address all of you at the opening of today's webinar on innovating agriculture, how Malaysia could become a high-tech agriculture hub. At the outset, outset, I would like to express my warmest gratitude on behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry, MAFI, to Agri Malaysia and the Kingdom of the Netherlands for co-hosting this webinar on this exciting and important issue for the Malaysian agriculture sector. I believe that with the right dialogue partners, this webinar will be able to achieve its objective, especially through the exchange of valuable knowledge from both countries in order to enhance the contribution of the agriculture sector to Malaysia's economy while improving food security and quality with the adoption of new technology and innovation. As we are all aware, the devastating and unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic transcends borders, compelling global communities to adopt and adapt into a new norm. 
it is high time for us to review some of our priorities to better brace ourselves for any global health calamity in the future. This includes improving food security and food production through optimizing the utilization of technology in agriculture. During the initial stage of the pandemic, the food distribution in Malaysia was also affected due to disruption in the supply chain. In the supply chain. However, with immediate intervention and constant monitoring of the situation on the ground by the Malaysian government, the food supply remains stable and under control. Difficult situations require innovative ideas and this is where rapid technology adoption becomes a necessity for the Malaysian agriculture sector. For your information, the ministry is, the, is in the midst of finalizing its new national agro-food policy. From the introduction of the policy, Malaysia is aspiring to develop her agriculture sector to embrace modernization and smart agriculture. For this to materialize, the whole ecosystem from the ministry to the industry players must be nimble and must be able to work hand in hand during its implementation. Malaysia can learn from the Netherlands experience and success in spurring the agriculture sector as one of the contributor to the Netherlands economy. The ability to bring together government institution, industry players, academia and NGOs to collaborate and develop her agriculture industry is one of the key ingredients for its success. In fact, the ministry also has an office based in the Hague, Netherlands, covering the Europe region to assist in areas such as market access, sanitary and phytosanitary, trade facilitation, bilateral agriculture cooperation, and to strengthen the collaboration in terms of transfer of technology. Ladies and gentlemen, the Messi welcomes the participation and collaboration between agriculture companies, universities, research institutions, NGOs from Netherlands with their Malaysian counterpart to join our effort in making Malaysia a hub for high technology agriculture. Given the strength of Malaysia in various aspects such as infrastructure, education, geographical location, incentive and stability, uh, economic stability, it is my hope that the cooperation between Malaysia and Netherlands will continue to produce mutual benefit. With the immense experience and ex expertise assembled today, I am confident this webinar will be beneficial and facilitate a very constructive exchange on agriculture innovation, providing useful insight to agriculture technology adoption in Malaysia and also in the Netherlands, and also exploring ways to strengthen its capacity. To end, I wish to everyone a fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Yinsin, you're still muted. So uh, thank you very much, um, Said Jen, uh, the, from the Malaysian Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries, uh, Dr. Haji Zainal, for sharing your thoughts with us. As you correctly and very aptly said that the world today actually needs sustainable agriculture that must simultaneously deliver food security, environmental sustainability, and economic opportunity. And I think from your speech just now, you also clearly said that a systematic transformation is needed um, at an unprecedented speed and also scale. And um, I completely agree with you when you said that government, private sector, the academia, and even perhaps the civil society would need to come together and work together to not only to innovate, but also to jointly transform the entire industry. And as the SAC Jen actually mentioned, this can only be done when everyone collaborates everyone come to the table together and bring to the table your forte, your expertise and knowledge. And I think this actually, um, you know, together with what the ambassador has said in his welcoming remarks, and then after listening to the highest leadership of the ministry uh, in Malaysia, of course, um, after the ministers, um, I think we are definitely going to be on the right footing, as in uh, the way forward to, number one is to learn from the Netherlands, a very, um, successful country in terms of agricultural development, agriculture technology, but 
I think Malaysia will then stand a very good chance to be able to innovate and transform ourselves to be one of the key global players moving forward. All right. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Mahalat Chumi Arujanan. She is the Executive Director of the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center, and she will be addressing us now. Uh, Yinsen, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me share my slide. Okay, let me let me know if you my slides are loading and if you can see my slides. So you see my slides now? Yes. Very yes. Well. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, every, uh, everyone, again, and I'm happy to be presenting on this very important topic because the Malaysian Biotechnology Information Center and also my parent institute, ISA. International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Applications. Uh, we are very much into technology transfer and um, linking different stakeholders in agriculture, as at least uh, said by the ambassador and also the secretary general that we need to become highly productive because of the unprecedented time and also because of many other challenges, climate change and um, growing populations and many things, which some of it I will be discussing. So. I want to start with um, the, the usual perception of agriculture. Uh, to me, as a science communicator, I see that it's often frustrating that a lot of people think that agriculture is like a very beautiful uh, sector. It is certainly beautiful, it's very important, but many people tend to romanticize agriculture, thinking that if it's agriculture, then you are going to see beautiful countryside, uh, green, uh, clean, and happy people working in the farm, but then agriculture has got its ugly side as well. You know, it, it brings in a lot of soil erosion, waste into our waterways, a lot of biomass that's being burnt. And in Malaysia, for example, we pay as haze every year. It's like our annual thing that we get used to it. And it also is a big producer of greenhouse gases. So with all these uh, challenges and the, envi the negative environmental footprint that agriculture bring, so we need to address this so that, of course, we, we still need agriculture. There's no way all our food can be produced in the laboratories. Although now we are also looking at that. Technology is allowing us to look at that. But again, that comes with another set of you know, public awareness, behavioral change. So, uh, But we still need farmers and the actual farm. So people should actually change their mindset to see that agriculture has got problems. And that is why we need many other technologies as well. So if we look at uh, uh, just the greenhouse gases, agriculture is the second greenhouse gas emitter after the transport and um, heat, uh, electricity uh, and heat industry. 13% of greenhouse gases comes from agriculture industry. And mainly these are carbon dioxide, uh, methane and nitrogen dioxide. This comes from cattle belching, a lot of it from livestock, natural synthetic fertilizers and manure management, rice cultivation, burning of crops and many other things. So I just want everyone who um, uh, is in agriculture might know this, but then the public, the consumers, I think people should know what agriculture brings uh, to us so that when we introduce new technology, it receives acceptance from the public. The, um, His Excellency Ambassador and also the Secretary General mentioned this, world population is growing and this has been said for so long, so it's nothing new. By uh, 2050, we are going to have 9.8 billion people. That is an additional of 2 billion people. It's really a huge amount. So what FAO says that uh, we need to produce 70% more food. Now, 70% more food from where? From the same planet. I don't think Elon Musk is going to have mass anytime now suitable for agriculture. So from the same planet that we live today. And in fact, from reduced resources, what, fresh water is reducing. Um, number of farmers reducing, num uh, the area of land is reducing. So with reduced resources, we need to produce more. How, how is that going to happen? Now, if we look at Malaysian uh, 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 statistics on that, affordability, we are ranked among 113 countries. This is from Economic um, Intelligence Unit. Uh, um, from, uh, from about 113 countries, we are ranked 28 in, in terms of uh, affordability. Now, before that, I think it's also important for everyone to understand what food security is. A lot of people think food security is there is enough food. That's not food security. There's only one component of food security. There might be enough food in Malaysia, 
but then in the small rural area that I live, I don't get food. So the food availability is not there. Now, even if I get the food, the food quality might not be there. Food safety might not be there. And even everything is there, I might not be having the uh, buying capacity or I can't afford to buy the food. So there are many components, affordability, availability, food uh, quality and safety. So for Malaysia, we are ranked 28 out of 113 countries, 26 when it comes to availability, 42 when it comes to quality and safety. Not so bad, but certainly we can become more innovative and more productive. So if we look at, I mean, I'm going to start with questions, food security. This, uh, there is no way we can actually strive, uh, strike a balance when it comes to food security or food self-sufficiency rate. Now, when we talk about should we be a uh, food um, self-sufficient, meaning should we be able to produce all the food that we want in our country? That is not really possible um, because, of course, some, some crops, are, uh, our climate does not allow us to grow those crops. But sometimes like rice, for example, even if we can grow 100% rice, is it going to be um, feasible? Do we have enough land? Do we have enough farmers? So that might be another problem. Sometimes the cost of importing might be lower than producing in our country. But then the thing is, we have to strike a balance between national security. Food is a national security item. Without food, political instability can happen. So we need to strike a balance between the cost and national security. For example, take a, uh, COVID, for example, we may have, we, we, might, we had all the money to buy the rice, but Thailand was actually um, stocking up their rice for emergency. So it is a matter of uh, national security. So what do we do? And um, does agriculture GDP show the real picture for Malaysia? I'm going to talk about that. So this is Malaysian um, GDP uh, that's contributed by agriculture. Of course, we see this trend in all countries because as we develop, we see that agriculture takes a slowly, it shrinks a little bit because we become more advanced manufacturing and other industry takes a bigger pie of the share. So agriculture becomes smaller. So that is what we've seen in Malaysia. I don't see something wrong in this, but then if we can increase the productivity, then we, um, then it might might help. So for now, Malaysia um, world average is 10.46. Uh, in 2019, ours is 7.3, so below 10. So that is the GDP contributed by agriculture for Malaysia. Now, again, having said that we contribute 7.3% of GDP through agriculture, does it really give the real picture? Now, look at, look at this. Uh, this is where our GDP from agriculture comes from. Oil palm is 38%. So oil palm is a commodity. Uh, we can't eat oil palm uh, as a staple food. But then 38% of what is contributed to GDP through agriculture actually comes from oil palm, which means we are not really that big when it comes to uh, uh, agriculture. Now, the others is livestock and poultry is 15%. Fishing is 12%. Uh, logging is uh, 7%. Of course, logging doesn't contribute to food security, uh, but it's, of course, it's important. And then rubber, still, um, we, we still are producing rubber, very small, 3%. And then all the other agriculture producers, uh, 25%. So if we look at other uh, things, of course, we have Malaysia has uh, uh, grown in other economic areas, services, manufacturing, mining, quarry, construction, and import um, duties. So we still need to do a lot so that we can increase our pie uh, that is related to agriculture. So if we look at employment uh, opportunities, fisheries, employment is 15,000 plus, total wages is 315, uh, forestry logging is 26,000 uh, plus employment and um, total wages is higher than fish, uh, fisheries, 700 plus million. Uh, um, this, is, this is ringgit. Huh? Crops, um, all, all crops put together is 368 and um, quite a lot of um, wages. Uh, that means these are the salaries earned by people in that sector. Livestock and poultry, 34,000 uh, plus, and the wages is 700 plus. Of course, oil palm is really big. It's 1 million, and, and I could not find the total wage. I'm sure it's a very big number, which is, a, which is healthy. Now, if we look at our farmers, how are we, uh, uh, I mean, our farmers doing? The average age of Malaysian farmers is 52.9, which is not very healthy because what happens when they stop farming uh, we don't have a succession plan we don't have many people young people coming into farming the basic primary education for farmers is 47 uh, the, those with primary education 47.5 um, percent of our farmers have primary education 
Secondary education is 42.9, so it's like almost almost uh, similar. Tertiary education, only 4% of uh, our farmers have tertiary education, meaning our graduates do not want to go into farming and no education um, is 3.5%. So this, I think this is where we need improvement as well. How can we encourage our younger people and those with education to get into farming, urban farming and uh, through modernization of farming. And if we look at food um, sufficiency, um, our food sufficiency, we rise is at 70%, 70 slightly above 70%. And um, we are doing good in cucumber, brinjal, spinach, eggs, uh, of course, poultry, we are doing well long beans, lady, lady's finger, pineapple, cuttlefish, banana shrimp. We are more than uh, what we need. Meat, tuna, crab is almost there. Uh, kumbung is a fish um, widely eaten by Malaysians. It's, I think it's called Indian mackerel, 83%. Coconut is 78% uh, in spite of having very conducive climate for coconut. Cabbage, chili is very low. And this is another area, Malaysia, in fact, I think I'm sure um, Minister of uh, Agriculture had a lot of chili project and we have got very good chili varieties, but more could be done because we still import chili from Thailand. And uh, I remember when uh, many years ago, when Thailand had very, very bad um, flood, we did not have chili in Malaysia. Beef and mango, very low and mutton is certainly very low. So what is our net import? Uh, we are a net importer, 24%. And import bill, our food import bill is uh, 54 uh, million ringgit and export bill is 35 million. So you see, we have a deficit um, in food bill. Floriculture, um, I picked floriculture because we are doing pretty well in flor floriculture. Um, we have two main floriculture. One is temperate and the other one is exotic. Temperate is mainly grown in Cameron Highlands, Goa Musang, all those little, uh, highland places. And our main temperate flowers are chrysanthemum, 44.7%, roses, 25%, and carnation, 12%. Um, and uh, most of it, 71%, uh, is um, exported. And we export to Japan, Thailand, Singapore, Australia, uh, and uh, UAE. Our exotic main one is uh, orchid. Um, and the orchid, uh, of course, dendrob uh, dendrobium is a very popular thing. And I know because I speak to a lot of orchid farmers uh, in Malaysia, and they say that um, they can't meet the demand. So there is so much can be done for orchid. And if we can get young people to uh, grow orchid, we, uh, there's so much of demand and they can't meet the uh, demand by, from the other countries. So the uh, uh, orchid is grown in hum, uh, hot and humid lowland and 28% is exported and mainly Singapore, Australia, Japan, and um, um, Arab, Saudi Arabia. So what is happening in floriculture? We have... Uh, competition from Vietnam and Thailand, very stiff competition. And um, this comes from a paper where farmers, uh, the producers of flowers spoke, and um, it was said that uh, they feel that there's no government subsidy or any preferential treatment for floriculture farmers. Uh, they also have difficulties in hiring foreign workers uh, and their stiff competition is um, uh, that their challenge is also when they want to export the um, high transportation fee and high import tax because other countries um, they, they have import ex, um, the fees. Now, the other competition comes from Chinese fl um, uh, flower, uh, uh, flowers where the government, our government is actually importing a lot of Chinese um, uh, flowers from China and they are much cheaper because our local market is not protected. Whereas in China, their market is protected. So this is not very healthy situation for our own farmers in Malaysia. So if we look at floriculture, it is growing, which is really good. Malaysian, um, and this is in USD. So it is a healthy thing, but I, uh, probably more can, could be done to support floriculture in Malaysia. So with biotechnology, now coming to technology, one technology that I picked up is uh, biotechnology. There was some discussion earlier, um, just about four years ago, five years ago, that um, the Ministry of Agriculture thought that we could grow corn in Malaysia and genetically modified corn. Uh, because we are a big importer of corn for both our poultry and livestock um, market, because we are very big in livestock. And um, we, we ourselves, Malaysia, we eat uh, poultry meat per person in one year for 49.4 kilogram, which is quite big. That's the cheapest meat and it's a healthy meat. So, uh, and we import 4.15 uh, million tons of corn 
in 2019 to 2020. So if we can grow genetically modified corn here instead of importing. Now, studies have been done and there are different discussions here. Some have said that the cost will be higher. Um, two, the cost might be higher, but I also mentioned that uh, what is important. Uh, are we willing to pay a little extra and make sure that national security is safeguarded? Um, and we, it also offers other employment opportunities uh, in agriculture. So these are the areas that is open for more discussion and probably open for more studies as well. So some of the reasons for low supply, local supply in all areas in agriculture, insufficiency of agriculture productions. Um, distribution network, we need to improve that. Our overall supply chain, we need to see where are the missing links and we need to improve that. Land availability, for example, there's an over-reliance on Cameron Highlands. Just that small highland produces 10% of all our vegetables that is uh, used in Peninsula Malaysia, Peninsula. Now, not to mention how much goes to Singapore. So, and we see the huge environmental impact uh, caused by farmers there when they infringe or encroach into forest uh, land to open up new farms. A raw input is um, and labor is a big problem that farmers face. Utilities and logistics uh, is also um, not really at the optimum level for farmers, whether it's cost or availability. And there are also many layers involving producers, processors, wholesale distributors, retailers, consumers, and all these actually affect uh, cost and final prices. The lack of economies of say, uh, scale, which means um, we are not still able to produce at a larger scale uh, with lower cost. So a lot of um, problems probably in the whole supply chain, raw material, taxation. So these are the things that we need to look into so that we can help our farming uh, industry. Mm -hmm lower price for imported products. So when imported products are coming in at a lower price, so our farmers are not able to uh, have a protected market or have a market where uh, they are uh, demand for lower uh, low, uh, for local products. Um, and sales and service tax, SST, for on raw materials used in agriculture or components and services. So maybe the government could also see how this could be reduced or, I mean, I'm not an economist, but uh, is it possible to abolish? So of course, these are, um, we, it, I mean, subject to more studies, discussion and consultation. So what can be done? Manufacturers could be given tax exemption or applying low tariffs on their imported, uh, imported raw and semi-processed materials that they use for farming and local food production. More land for agriculture, but again, we can't be opening up too many land and then that also creates the uh, environmental footprint. So it has to be sustainable. And this is where precision agriculture, IoT, drone, and many other things, uh, His Excellency mentioned that as well. Um, our SEC Gen also mentioned that. So we need technologies. Um, how about, um, you know, adopting uh, agri-biotechnology, genetically modified um, crops. So this is where, because I'm involved in biosafety regulations and speaking to the regulators, scientists, and also industry, we feel that the current biosafety law in Malaysia, the law is good, but the implementation process needs to be more science-based. Um, and also how we need to look into uh, vertical and urban farming where I think a lot of countries are going into this. And as Malaysia urbanized, I'm going to end. This is my last uh, one. Uh, and also aquaculture, uh, protein from fish is going to be the next, you know, it's going to be the next wave in agriculture. And we need a seed industry in Malaysia. Malaysia lacks seed industry. So finally, uh, we need to look at agriculture and look at all the challenges that we are facing, labor intensive and aging farming and how technology can enable it and looking at the three sustainable uh, pillars, which is environment, economic, and uh, social. And for that, science, technology, innovation is certainly important. So with that, thank you very much. Sorry for taking a little extra time. Thank you very much, Dr. Maha, for sharing with us such a comprehensive, um, you know, masterclass, I would say. And certainly this short panel session will never do justice to all your knowledge, your hard work. And we all know that you are a very hands-on person. And that's why your perspective is so rich, the way you share with us. We could actually feel so much passion in you. And uh, the interesting thing is that you actually started your presentation with uh, by talking about the ugly side of agriculture on affordability, quality and safety, availability. And actually, those are the things that many people do not realize because when people talk about food security people always think about do we have enough food so i think um your your um your deliberation earlier actually um i, I believe 
would have opened up a lot of minds uh, among the audience. Um, and, and also, you, you correctly pointed out um, four key points that I, that I really liked, which is the key challenges that most agriculture uh, sector is facing. I think, I think, and I think these four challenges go beyond Malaysia, uh, where you talk about inclusivity, sustainability, efficiency, and also whether the food's going to be nutritious and healthy. But um, maybe during the Q&A session, we will be able to, um, I mean, of course, uh, with the, um, you know, when we, if, time, uh, if time allow us to do that, maybe we'd like to talk a bit about um, your idea about uh, genetically modified crops, because I know that that itself opened up a, another can of worms. There are a lot of people who agree, a lot of people who, who will never uh, agree with uh, genetically modified uh, crops. But, uh, but it is interesting that you actually brought it, uh, brought it up uh, in this presentation. Uh, well, uh, after we listened to Dr. Maha with a comprehensive um, presentation of her thoughts and what's actually happening on the ground, we have an interesting poll for all the audience to participate. So if you'd like to take some time to quickly look at this, um, what look at you know, the question as in what should be the top three priorities to increase GDP contribution for agricultural sector? Uh, pick your answer and it will be interesting to see uh, what are your thoughts. And of course, the Secretariat uh, will be sharing the feedback of the poll with all of us here. Yin Chin, there's a little bit of a technical problem. I think the audience can only press one answer. So we're gonna bring it up again where they, indeed they can tick three answers. Just one second, please. It's coming up again. Three answers, right? All right, look like there is a small technical glitch over here. Although we always talk about innovating with technology, we need to transform. Uh, yes, we can't really, uh, you know, organize a large event uh, with everybody in one room due to social distancing. So therefore we are doing the online poll, but somehow with a little bit of technical glitch, uh, we have to give the secretary a little bit of time to okay, the request is made to do the poll during the Q&A later. So if you can please move the program along. Thank you. All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, we will come back to the poll later during the Q&A session. And we would now like to invite Dr. Mohammad Dessa bin Haji Hasim, the Deputy Director of the Crop Quality Control Division from the Department of Agriculture Malaysia to share his slides and presentation with us. All right, we have seen to have lost Dr. Dessa. He used to be online. He was visited as a panelist and we have lost him. We will try to reconnect, but I Next think it's, uh, time, it's time to move on to uh, Frederick. All right, look like, looks like we have another technical glitch over here. We lost Dr. Mohamed Dessa on the line, uh, but never mind. We have um, a speaker uh, from the Netherlands, actually two speakers from the Netherlands. Uh, so let, let us now hear from Mr. Frederick. Senor, I hope that I got your name correctly. He's a special envoy of the Agro, uh, Agro Business Development Unit from the Nature and Foods, uh, Food Quality Netherlands from the Ministry of Agriculture. And so without further ado, let us now invite Mr. Frederick to the floor. Good morning to you. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Yes, both. Yes, you can. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, for having me in this seminar. I'm really excited. I I, I worked um, in the um, embassy in Thailand for as an agricultural counselor for a while. and was also accredited to Malaysia, so it's a great pleasure to be in this webinar this morning. Um, my presentation is about uh, how the Netherlands became the second largest exporter of agricultural uh, agriculture in the world. Um, so the um, the let me.
reach out to the next one. Some some information that might be useful about uh, the agriculture in Holland is actually we have a very small landmass. Really, we're a very small country. Uh, you can see the agricultural area in the in the slide. It's uh, it's it's quite modest. Uh, about uh, one million hectares of grassland we have, and um, we are famous for vegetables and fruits and and, and so. But that's about only a hundred thousand hectares. And as you can see, only 9,000 uh, hectares is of um, is a uh, glass houses, and that's where the famous flowers and the uh, fruits, vegetables come from, and it has given the Netherlands a very competitive image. Um, and I'll speak about that later. The other thing that I want to highlight is that there's always a lot of talk about the European uh, common policies and all the subsidies and the protection that it offers to farmers. In fact, the, the, the most competitive sectors of our agriculture are those that uh, did not have such heavy EU regulation like uh, potatoes, pork, uh, the glasshouse horticulture, flowers, poultry. Uh, dairy is maybe the only exception, but for the climate, um, producing milk in our um, climate is very uh, a competitive thing. But mostly... It was left to it says the largest food producers i think it's better to uh, as you have called it uh, food exporters here as you see the united states is by far the largest export of agricultural products but what stands out is the netherlands being uh, the second largest is the very small area in uh, on, on which we produce that uh, um, that value of the of our exports. So now, when it comes to the origin of the Dutch competitiveness in agriculture, while you see uh, one of um, a typical glasshouse, the, the 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 answer is is basically very simple. the 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 origin of Dutch competitiveness in agriculture is innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, I could wish you a very pleasant day and then and uh, hook out of the seminar, but. So the, the, the first thing that I think I should mention is, of course, we have a very strategic uh, location in Northwestern Europe with, with many rich markets nearby. Um, if you have high quality perishable products to bring them to your customer, you, of course, need superior logistics. I think with the um, Schiphol Airport and Rotterdam Port, we have built It certainly is very important to, to, to satisfy your, your customers' needs. And of course, we are um, a trading country. So we have discovered a long time ago that imports contribute a lot to our exports. For example, the Netherlands is the second, this is the Netherlands, eh? the second largest exporter of avocado in the world. Uh, and why that is? Uh, well, because it takes a lot of ripening and uh, the producers from Peru or Mexico or um, uh, South Africa, they ship these products to the Netherlands. We do the ripening, supply them on time to the, to the retail. And with such uh, product flows, we can easily also distribute our own vegetables. So, and avocado is just an example, but imports contribute a lot to our exports. You can see in this slide, I talked about your strategic location, but if you look at these circles that for, you, for example, uh, Milan, a very uh, uh, rich market in the northern part of Italy is only uh, just more than 750 kilometers. Paris is within the 500 kilometer range. Um, the, uh, the German market is, uh, is very close. And we have been providing food to cities already from a long time, I think. United Nations celebrated or, 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 or marked a few years ago that more than half of the population on the world was living in cities. Uh, and this landmark was actually uh, reached in the Netherlands already in the 17th century. The Netherlands was the first country in which more than half of the population was living in cities. The second country in this respect was Great Britain and it, was, it happened 200 years later there. So our farmers have been providing food to the markets uh, for, uh, for centuries and it has become a part of their DNA to uh, comply with the demands of, of uh, consumers, not only in our country, but also in these markets near, nearby. 
Now, what I think the second pillar of our uh, uh, agricultural success is surely also the, the, the sectorial interaction and, and the way the various parties in the supply chain connect to one another. You can see in this slide part of the Westland area, which is the most famous glasshouse area in the Netherlands, squeezed, squeezed in between The Hague and Rotterdam, the second and third largest uh, cities of, uh, of our country. And um, these people, you see glass houses, but it's, a, it's basically an ecosystem that you see here. It's an ecosystem because, well, you can build a glass house, but you also need uh, specialists or supplying companies uh, in, um, in different uh, uh, aspects of the supply chain. You can see some here. I hope this slide is, is visible, but you need good, for example, water and nutrient systems. You need exporters, you need financing, you need um, uh, lightning experts, people that know how to handle robotization or automation. And the Netherlands is, in this respect is very much uh, an ecosystem. So it's, it's, it's not about just constructing a glass house, but you need, you need a whole lot. And that made the Netherlands in the um, theory of the Harvard professor, um, uh, uh, the port supporter, uh, an example, um, all the characteristics that uh, Porter listed that are needed for innovation, you can find in the Netherlands. In fact, he used the, the Dutch um, uh, cut flower sector as an example for his theory. Uh, and you can see the characteristics of the Porter model in the slides, but the Netherlands uh, um, fulfills these criteria, not only for cut flowers, but I think also for poultry for pork, for dairy, for potatoes. You have these pockets of knowledge in the country that make the sectors uh, quite uh, competitive. Like this is, this is the, um, the ecosystem that you would use for uh, a horticulture. Uh, you see it runs from education and, and breeding materials from primary production to sales and trade. And um, it runs along with many different uh, specialized sectors supplying inputs to these um, greenhouse sectors. So you can see them on the slide, you know, like, as I mentioned, the water systems and energy systems, crop protection, various uh, things. Um, that also runs, um, the, the connection to the other sectors is not only limited to horticulture, but also to the other sectors of our economy, like lo logistics, as I already mentioned, the, the high-tech materials, uh, but also the creative sector, for example, like, if you have high quality tomatoes to, to get them to the consumer in an appealing way that you, you, know, you, you create a nice packaging and things, this kind of cooperation outside of the, um, the horticultural sector in a strict sense, we consider very essential. Now, I think the third pillar of the success of Dutch agriculture is surely related to the, the cooperation that we have between the government the private sector and the research institutes. And that happens on various levels, not only national level, but also the, the, the regional level. Uh, I think about half of our country is below sea level. Uh, that's always the, the historic um, explanation for this kind of cooperation that you want to build dikes and polders. You cannot do that by yourself. You have to work along with um, the government and the, and the private sector and the research institutes to, to keep it all floating. Um, this has also been a very uh, useful model for uh, the co-financing in research. For example, if uh, farmers uh, have a need for some research to be done, they talk to the government, um, they talk to research institutes, but the financing is then also something that we, uh, we prefer we share to make sure that the research that done actually fulfills the requirements of the farmers or related companies. So, um, the cooperation extends to education, which of course is hugely important, sometimes also underestimated. Farming is just not a simple business. Um, we have a very um, uh, top university, Wageningen University, I think is famous in the whole world. But the vocational training and the, uh, and the practical training are just as important and the, 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 they, they are connected and make sure that the program that they teach is also in line with what companies need and what uh, research institutes finally uh, are looking for. So the fourth pillar, I think, of our success uh, is the, I think, and, and it's really a source of innovation, is the proximity 
of farming activities to cities. And, and, and there's always, um, this might be a nuisance to farmers, but I think it has also led to a lot of innovation where, where citizens, for example, you know, they complain about the smell of animal husbandry or the use of pesticides because it is happening in their backyard. Um, and it's still a nuisance um, in our country. Also, a lot of political discussions follow out of this. But it, and the transparency and innovation that it creates in the farming sector has been a source of innovation. For example, the, the, the use of um, um, or abolishing pesticides is, was very much driven not only by consumers, but also by citizens. Um, the Netherlands is the second largest export of agricultural products, uh, and it's certainly not our ambition to become uh, the number one in the world. We, we exported last year, I think, two billion euros worth of tomatoes. And that's all nice, but the most important thing, and, and I think also very much our ambition, is to make sure that other countries can produce with Dutch technology the same kind of tomatoes. This, this picture I took in India in a, in a Dutch style greenhouse, and uh, these tomatoes were shipped to the shelves of an Indian retailer. And they, the, the guy put on the package crafted by Dutch technology. And I think uh, if, you, if consumers in foreign countries can see this as a recommendation, then we sort of uh, reached our goals. Um, and this, of course, is also available to, um, to Malaysia. We, we know Malaysia is a very competitive uh, and very uh, strong country when it comes to agriculture. Uh, working together with Malaysian entrepreneurs and with Malaysian stakeholders is uh, something that we really aspire. So uh, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to address such a um, distinguished Malaysian audience. And I hope in the future, the embassy can be uh, the bridge to stronger cooperation in agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Frederick for sharing, uh, well, all the success stories from the Netherlands with us. I mean, uh, we all know that the Netherlands is so famous for your tulips, your cheese, your dairy products. And of course now, wow, I know you have tomatoes going around the world as well. Well, you, at the beginning of your presentation, you clearly stated three very pertinent points that perhaps uh, this is what Malaysia is lacking. I mean, of course, from my perspective, um, it's like the rich market nearby. The word rich could be rich in uh, consumer demand, consumer spending. Maybe this is something that is a little bit lacking in this region. And then imports contribute to export. This really put, put us, uh, you know, thinking uh, what, uh, what more can we do so that we can also emulate uh, what uh, the Netherlands have done. And of course, superior logistics. Uh, you know, Rotterdam have... Um, fantastic logistic system, the network. Um, I, I witnessed this um, firsthand when I was visiting the Netherlands uh, some, times ago, some time ago. But of course, uh, you also mentioned about proximity of farming activities uh, somehow have resulted in constant innovation and sustainability drive. And then uh, after listening to your success stories from the Netherlands, that actually kept me thinking, uh, you know, comparing what the Netherlands have done successfully and then looking at ourselves and then suddenly I realized that we have the issue of inadequate uh, infrastructure or not as perfect as uh, the Netherlands uh, in terms of information, perhaps financial inclusion. All these are some of the key factors that actually make things difficult for farmers to actually gain access to cost-effective products, services and information that could actually boost their productivity and profitability. And the way do you share the entire map as in the entire ecosystem network that make agriculture works. I think that is something very important that maybe perhaps and many other countries will be able to look at Netherlands as a success uh, stories for us to learn from. All right, uh, I was told Dr. Mohamed Dessa bin Haji Hassim, uh, the Deputy Director uh, from the Crop Quality Control Division of the Department of Agriculture Malaysia is back with us online. May I now um, invite Dr. Mohamed Dessa to address us. Dr. Dessa, please also unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for uh, Ms. Chair and uh, distinguished uh, guest speaker and uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether from in Malaysia, in Netherlands on, or in other, any other countries who uh, view my uh, speech. Today, uh, I would like to talk about uh, a overview of uh, Department of Agriculture Initiative and Opportunities in terms of how Malaysia could become a high-tax agriculture hub. The focus uh, today, we'd like to talk about what activities uh, in the uh, Department of Agriculture, focusedly uh, mainly in, into uh, Can see my slide, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, discussing more on uh, how uh, Malaysia could become a high tech culture. We just uh, listened from the first speaker and second speaker to share the experience and overview of Malaysia and also the the success story from uh, Netherlands that are very impressive uh, for us to uh, for Malaysians uh, departments of agriculture. Our roles uh, for the Department of Agriculture just uh, beside on the spirit uh, agriculture transformation process as a modern sectors. And uh, the main uh, activity is uh, to ensure food pr production are sufficient and affordable, uh, productions uh, sufficient and affordable for the peoples in the countries. We also uh, provide in terms of uh, one-stop agriculture consultations, technical support service, that's uh, one sort of activity to extend the technology enhancements to develop human uh, capital for the agriculture sectors. We have a training center, we have uh, farming to train the farmers and also to train the uh, youth to support the industries in Malaysia. For the purpose of the country, we uh, also the role to protect the country interest for the industry. And uh, this is a major issue and challenge for the agriculture sectors in Malaysia. The first, we are lacked in terms of seed, quality seed produced in the country. Most of our seed production are import mainly from uh, European countries and also Netherlands is one source of the, our seed uh, technology and seed for farmers, especially like tomato and also for the floriculture sectors. We have a problem to the high cost of productions because uh, implementations of the technologies they lag behind compared to uh, your countries and the level of uh, technical applications and low productivity and also inefficient using of lands and, and the problem of uh, low level of technology application. Besides that, we also still depending on the labor force mainly from foreign labor. Okay. Okay, based on our climate conditions, Malaysia is uh, good uh, in terms of weather. We have a sunset around the year, throughout the year, and also we receive a rainfall patterns around the year and the temperature between the 30 to 30 degrees. This is very uh, suitable for the climate condition, especially for the tropical fruits and also tropical crop in the countries. This is, we have a land portal, we have a suitable land, very good for agriculture production, but we still have the issue because the implementations of technology still lag behind in terms of this because of social and implementations of the impact in terms of economic and socioeconomic, we still need some support from uh, member countries of other countries or any technology to bring in Malaysia. So, the, the next we have to show you what the Department of Agriculture approves to ensure that in the future next planning for the next simulation plan, we have integrated into focus into four categories. First, for the food safety. Second, we want to introduce the agriculture 4.0 and to meet it, we have to develop the capacity building project, uh, program and project exclusive for the focus into, into a few areas. So with these, we focus is for, for the agriculture produce in Malaysia. We want to produce to ensure that to, for the export orientations and focus for selected community, I will talk after this, and then to ensure that food safety and to work together with the private public partnership. This is one idea that we share with you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ensure that food safety, we have a quality certification program. We call the MyGap certification. 
This is ongoing to equivalent with a global gap in the near future. Now we have uh, successful in dealing to the Asian gap and the next step with the global gap to ensure that our product can market into your countries, into uh, other countries. These instruments, we also have the program for organic, we have produced our organic Malaysia. And this is one of the certification program to ensure that quality and safe into the global market. So ladies and gentlemen, this is one of our strategy for the Department of Agriculture. We would like to produce the tropical fruits for the global market. Like in Netherlands, major production is a floriculture and also for the vegetables like tomatoes and others. But now in Malaysia would like to focus a program to produce more, uh, more uh, tropical fruit to the global market which is uh, we work together with the strategic partnership with the industry and we're working together with the exporter. This is one opportunity for the Dutch company to work together with us to produce a tropical fruits, especially for first durian, papaya, jackfruits, watermelon, and pineapple. This is a major tropical fruits in Malaysia. We have a long history to produce these kinds of tropical fruit that very success in terms of the quality, and taste very good to know you. And then so this is uh, uh, about, uh, these are five commodities that we want to focus in the next five years, plan to produce upon pineapples, jackfruit, papaya, watermelon, and durian. With this, we uh, try to export the value export. Uh, you can see the value export from the year 2015 to 2018 increasing every year. And this is we want to export. If we focus that, uh, Malaysia very tropical fruits has increased from 1.8 billion in 2050 to 1.2 billion in 2018. And then we have focused the increasing, we go for every every year to become a, to be 2.7 billion in the next five years. This is one of the program we want to focus and target very focused to produce this kind of tropical fruits for the local production and to export a market opportunity. So within that, so we have to improve to ensure that this uh, quality through an increased export and run the farm practice we will imply of good agriculture practice in to ensure that the quality will be improved, increase the productivity, and we want to expand the market toward market access to the global market, particularly in Western market and also to Eastern market and a middle mid market. This is a major for the focus for the durian. You will see in the next five years, we already have a self-sufficient level and we will increase the export market. Now we have about 70,000 uh, hectares area that we can produce around five to 10 ton hectares to ensure that the productions can meet the demand in the near future. Right now, the uh, main market for the durian export is to China and also to the, to the European market in the near future. And uh, this is a planting area. We showed it in the four state that major production area in Pahang, Jogo, and Sarawak. And then uh, this is a, a second fruit we want to focus is a jackfruit. You know, jackfruits now are trendy for the vegan meat, not only to eat the fresh. In the European and American market, vegan meat is one potential to produce from, with, from the uh, tender jackfruits we can produce into uh, vegan meat. We can substitute the meat that's uh, very good for the health and also to the consumer in the near future. This is uh, one of the production of jackfruits in the three states of Malaysia, like in Negeri Sembilan. Uh -huh. and uh, <clears throat> and Para also produce the, the, the uh, Joho state uh, produce uh, main area for the jackfruit. And the third forecast is uh, papaya. You know, papaya, we have very good variety in papaya. We have uh, exotica uh, papaya, and also we have one food papaya. This is a premium uh, papaya uh, for the export market. And then uh, the area productions in Sabah, in Paham, we have this. We have enough and area to produce is if we have the markets for the next step into markets. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the next is a watermelon. You know that in Malaysia, we have very suitable area to produce watermelon in the Eastern area. And also we focus to increase the productions. The productivity now is about 17, 17 tons per hectare. 
but with the technology, maybe we can produce more than double production. So that we need to have from the technology provider, some like the entrepreneur or technology company from the Netherlands to help us to produce more quality and high yielding of watermelon. This is a potential huge market to the European and also to other countries market in the future. So this is area for the uh, watermelon production in Johor in the south and the north in Kelantan and Trengganu in the east of Malaysia. And presently we have already a uh, program to uh, market access to the many country like Australia, <laughs> Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, and also to your uh, uh, United States, Canada, and also to the EU market. This is the market status, what we have been done for the, for the uh, market of produce of Malaysia, so like uh, <clears throat> for the all type of fruits or form of fruits we can export to EU market easily, uh, to Hong Kong, Middle East, Singapore, Jack fruits already to Indonesia, Vietnam, Canada, Taiwan, Japan, New Zealand, China, United States, and Australia. For the durian, Australia, China, we are ready. And uh, we can try to the Middle East and also to the European markets in the next few years. And uh, watermelon also to Canada, China, Indonesia, Japan, and also to European markets like the Netherlands also can enter the market presently. So this is a potential for the target crop community to decrease import. This is our strategy to produce more mango, chili, cabbage, and ginger. This one to substitute our local productions to ensure that now we import a lot of these kinds, three, four, five, uh, three, four community from other countries to Malaysia. The sufficient level for chili, cabbage, and ginger less than 40% so that we want to increase more in the next few years. So this is one opportunity for the investor, for the investment from Dutch company or any other company to involve in the production in Malaysia. In uh, Malaysia, the Department of Agriculture can facilitate in terms of area plantations, in terms of uh, for the labor and also expertise for the, for the workers we have enough skill level to work with, but we need more technology to work together. So for the next strategy, this is one opportunity, Department of Agriculture will bring more to be shared in private partnership. We call that strategic partnership between the private and, and a public partnership to work together into this uh, field of area, crop research and development, Second, uh, mechanization, automation, internet of things and others, breeding and seed production, soil fertility and plant nutrition. So we need to help of us. And then also pesticide, biofertilizer, biofesticide. Also, we work together with this pests and diseases control. And then the post house technology in terms of agriculture extension, urban agriculture, capacity building, and et cetera. This is a major that we understand that the situation, if we improve this kind of uh, collaboration between the public private partnership, this is when we see uh, for the second speaker already talked about this uh, through a public private partnership, we can work together between the private and government to ensure that the delivery system and also the successful become very easy in terms of production, we work together between private and public to make to aim one target in the strategy. Uh, you have 20 seconds to uh, conclude your presentation. Okay, and then this is one uh, one example from the uh, private company. We can see this from uh, from the Netherlands as a Zealand working in to seed production in Malaysia. And it's a way forward. We would like to invest, we would like to invite all of you to work together with us invest in potential crop production for export market and then to invest in seed production industry become a seed hub in Malaysia for local and so well market and then we to invite we transfer some Dutch technology to boost agriculture production in Malaysia we have highland and also lowland area that you can work together with us and then to link the tropical food market into EU market. This is one opportunity for you and uh, promote conducive business environment. And then we work together with between strategic partnership between Dutch company, Department of Culture, and local company. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Between these, we have uh, invest, invest, to uh, invest in Malaysia agriculture sectors. We have investment incentive opportunity. We have a tax allowance incentive for view, uh, for the food production project, agriculture allowance, building capacity, and then we have a tax incentive for training, incentive for export, incentive for research and development, incentive for high technology project. Also, we can offer to you. Do that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mamad Desa, for a comprehensive briefing of where Malaysian agriculture is going, where, what we have achieved, and way forward of what will be the opportunities uh, lying ahead of us. And you have correctly uh, and aptly pointed out that the PPP model is actually the best way forward, if I could say so, as you... Uh, you deliberated that to achieve those goals that Malaysia wanted to achieve, we actually require a transformation of the, agri of the entire agriculture sector. We need to learn to leverage on market-based approaches through a coordinated effort by all stakeholders, including farmers, government, civil society, and also the private sector. And of course, the key success factor uh, of agriculture sector transformation at the the national level for Malaysia would definitely then include the setting the right direction through effective leadership, strategy and investment models, and also scaling the transformation through finance, infrastructure, institutions, and monitoring. So thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Desa, for sharing about with us today. Uh, last but not least, I would now like to invite Mr. Damien. He is the Business Development Director of one of the largest agriculture um, company in the Netherlands, Surathon, and he will be sharing with us um, and showcasing some of the best practices and success stories from the company with us. Yeah. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, as introduced, my name is Damien Schwarzkappel from Sheraton. Um, well, thank you for all the speakers in front of me, Mr. Ambassador, the other directors and Secretary General. Um, I'd like to uh, yeah, give you an inspiration session uh, where the, the question is central, how innovations facilitate the ecosystems of the entire production uh, chain. Uh, I will focus in that regard more on the horticulture uh, sector, because that's where our company, Sarton, is uh, more active in. Uh, I hope you can see my sheen, uh, screen share. Okay, perfect. So the technology does not fail us today. Um, so uh, I speak on behalf of Sarton and Horizon 11. We cooperate together. Uh, Sarton is a Dutch company from the Westland region. It's a picture you already saw uh, at the presentation of Mr. Fossenaar. Um, and Seton has also a strategic uh, alliance with the Japanese company Denso, which I will explain a little bit more on later on. So, um, being from Holland, being from the Westland area, um, I think it's, uh, we talk about innovations and technology and horticulture and agriculture, but it's more than that. It's something which is in our roots. Uh, the horticulture is a culture and tradition where we grew up with um, a way of, a, say, a lifestyle, how to produce uh, vegetables and to be able to um, make in a protected environment an ideal condition to grow vegetables. This is a picture now of uh, already in 19, around 1900, where in the Westland area, a lot of grape growers were active. Um, the greenhouses back then looked a lot similar to the solar greenhouses in China or we have a brick wall and uh, glass cladding and a wooden structure and whole families cooperated to do the harvesting and the pruning of the, of the grapes. Today, you will not find any grape production anymore in Holland that has been exported to other countries, but we exchange that to other industries, which I will uh, tell you uh, more about. I will now show you first a movie about where we stand today, what we can do of growing crops and vegetables in controlled environments. You can name this indoor farming or urban farming. For us, it's an indoor farm where we use and implement technology we learned over time uh, to do it without daylight even. Basically, this technology can be implemented anywhere in the world. Uh, the crucial question is where is there demand and where does the opportunities that lie in the market uh, fit with this uh, condition. So the, the time lapse you saw was the growing of a tomato crop. 
growing from a young plant to a first ripe tomatoes and the bottom you see them hanging uh, within 63 days. The innovations and like you saw in the time lapse, the innovations we we uh, we are working on in Holland are not just focused on technical perspective. They're uh, integral and multidisciplinary, which means that it's about knowledge of the plants. It's about knowledge of the technology, the climate control, irrigation, the hydroponic control. Uh, it's about knowledge of collecting data and how to implement that in the food supply chain. It's about packing, storage. So basically you could say that in Holland, we've been working uh, for a long time already on making a blueprint of a whole ecosystem where it's not just about growing of the plant, but something where we as a company accelerate in our technology solutions, but it goes beyond that. We need to cooperate with other uh, steps in the supply chain to make, uh, to make it successful, which would be an advice as well to Malaysia don't only focus on the horticulture growing, but make it broader. Make sure that there's good distribution, good infrastructure. In universities, the training on plant knowledge and horticulture knowledge is also uh, being uh, attended for. If we look to the innovations, then uh, these days, it's not just about what technology can do, but also getting the right data and getting the right knowledge to apply that data. Basically, we from greenhouses and from growing uh, crops, we can collect a lot of data and uh, being knowledgeable in the field on how these plants grow. But it's more interesting to know what can we do with it and how can we use this data to, uh, uh, to support the innovations that are required. And those can be from the perspective of energy, from the growing of the plant, climate control, but also for instance, to uh, change the supply chain and to make the production much more lean and connected to the demand in the market. This is a picture of the Westland area where we are based. Uh, our ecosystem is full of greenhouses and still it's, a, it's for us as a company, we work worldwide with our solutions, but it's an important hub where we collectively work with universities, uh, other growers, uh, technology suppliers, uh, where we develop our solutions and make them suitable to be implemented in other parts of the world. There's still a lot of innovation and knowledge being developed here in Holland, and that will be our uh, focus to keep developing that in Holland and to expert, export that knowledge uh, in cooperation to other countries. This development of knowledge is key, so there's cooperation between growers and companies. It's a cooperation within research and applied research institutes like universities, uh, within management of the, of the whole supply chain and ecosystem. Uh, for instance, industrial standards and organizations are important for that. To have education, and so also to make it attractive for young people to enter in this industry, and also to be supported by government uh, with policies and supporting and putting it high on the agenda. In Holland, we have, for instance, the top sector strategy where horticulture and the export of horticulture is one of the key items where we focus on. Um, this has been mentioned before, but our footprint is huge as a small country, uh, also being recognized in this article of the National Geographic, where uh, they wonder how can this small country export so much produce into the world? Uh, and yeah, maybe they, uh, they are right uh, that yes, we do that, but slowly we're changing that because of COVID and COVID uh, also uh, speeds up the development of more national uh, strategies and implementation of uh, local year round food production and increasing food security in, in other countries like Malaysia uh, is now being the trend. This article is already four years old but the key is the knowledge that we collected will be implemented. So horticulture, um, since we are able to, with our technologies, control more, know more, steer more on data, uh, the implementation of robotics, automation, machine learning, other fields of uh, innovations become uh, on the agenda on the short term. 
that's why Certon chose to, for instance, work with a Japanese company to uh, implement robotic solutions, uh, which can solve, for instance, the workforce, which is always difficulty and also what we saw in the previous presentation, the age of farmers. Uh, the robotization will become an important uh, agenda. So I'll give you some inspirations of uh, how modern uh, horticulture can look like. These are projects we developed. Uh, this is an indoor farm where in multi-layers lettuce crops are being grown, not because we want to put it in an urban farm and in a multi-layer, but because the planning of this production is essential to deliver it in time to the retail and the quality should be year-round stable and, and it's fully robotized. Uh, also, well, this is uh, the opening of the, of the project I just showed where our king and queen also showed interest and why they wondered, how can this grow without natural conditions? Well, basically, we imitate the nature. We learn so much from growing and horticulture over the past century, and we learn so much about how plants behave and how we can influence plant behavior, and we use technology to do that. So there's nothing uh, artificial or uh, being simulated, which is not natural to the plants. I think that's important. With the indoor farms, we also learn a lot and implement in greenhouses. So greenhouses become more modern and uh, greenhouses are being upgraded almost to an indoor farm where uh, the models are much more flexible. This is a greenhouse in the center of France where we implemented a lot of technologies and where at the nights the screens are closed in the winter time and the lights are on. Basically at this situation, it's an indoor farm, but during the summer, and the daytime, we still use the natural light conditions. So basically, we're looking always to the best uh, inputs and resources and the most sustainable solution that the, the circumstances can give. Another example where greenhouses uh, operated fully autonomous. So the grower is still uh, involved, the farmer is still involved, but at a lower level, the control and the automation and the decisions for climate control are much more pushed forward to a climate computer. With key set points, it can generate automatically. Uh, and then the next step, which I already pointed out, the greenhouses, uh, is the robotization and the arbor force. This is an example of uh, one of the first uh, pilots with the robots for harvesting the tomatoes. Uh, robots are already used for grading produce, for packing, for a lot of industries, but the workforce within the greenhouses, especially, especially fruit crops, still need a lot of uh, labor activities. They can be replaced uh, to a larger degree in the coming years by robotization. So the perspective which we bring from Holland and what we learned is uh, also, as Frederik already pointed out, we have a small country, so we need to be very scarce with the resources we have. Our scarce resources land in another country. The scarce resources water in another country. It's the whole uh, energy and sustainability perspective for the workforce. So what we try to do by increasing the technology and the solutions, we minimize the footprint of our resources. So less carbon footprint, less food miles, less water usage, uh, and we increase the yield. And we increase the yield by the level of control, the technology, uh, and also the implementation of robotization or autonomous greenhouse solutions. Then I'd like to end with an example of a project we developed uh, in the middle of the desert of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's a pilot greenhouse of almost one hectare where tomatoes are grown in a fully arid greenhouse. And this, the comparison is simple. Two years ago, no tomatoes from the from the desert, at least not year-round, and not to the high standards of the uh, of our, uh, say, Dutch quality, which is largely imported into the UAE. Uh, and in the UAE, where the food security uh, has been put also very high on the agenda. Uh, and now today, with this greenhouse, local tomatoes can be grown, same as the other example from uh, India, where the produce are marketed to the local market and also produce locally for year-round production. This is a picture from the inside. There's abundant of light, which makes a lot of Dutch growers very jealous and happy 
because actually that's one of the key resources and that's widely available and with our solutions and our knowledge from the Dutch horticulture we implement very energy sensitive and sustainable solutions to grow year-round tomatoes and the result is a local branded tomato product sold to the retail year-round to conduct the sustainable solutions are very important so it's important to uh, to understand that it's not only the plant growing but it touches in also in, into other industries like uh, where i started with the infrastructure the packing the supply chain the sales the branding but also for the production more focused the production of more technology uh, based uh, greenhouses and solutions or indoor farms also touches much more in in development of sustainable energy systems and use of water this is a picture where you see uh, Saudi Arabia where because of the scarcity of water the whole agriculture production for fodder for animals has been uh, forbidden uh, we must not come to these levels of uh, very uh, rigid decisions so let's approach it integral and use the knowledge and step up in policies step up in business and step up in technology and implementations of all the availability of knowledge and solutions there are, that there are now. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if there are further questions, maybe in the Q&A, otherwise at another moment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Damien, for a very um, concise and sharp presentation of yours. And thank you so much for sharing with us that technology that emerging technologies really do have the potential to shape consumer diets and consumption behaviors in ways that could actually significantly impact food systems and that sustainability, uh, sustainably producing the right quantity and quality of food to meet the nutrition demands of the world can really be enabled by technologies. So thank you very much for sharing such, you know, such a success stories of what you are doing every day with with audiences, especially coming from Malaysia. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now bring back the poll question that we wanted to do earlier, but due to technical glitch, we couldn't do so. So the secretary will be putting up the poll question for you to um, pick. So you please uh, choose three answers and then we will be able to share uh, the outcome of the poll with all of us online as well. So let's do this very quickly. So what should be the top three priorities to increase GDP contribution from agriculture sector? All right, there's a lot to read in this question, but we will give you another seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, we close the poll and we'll bring up the results as quickly as possible. Here they are already. And we would also like to invite all speakers again to uh, turn on the cameras, please, and their microphones. All right, so... Um... Due to time limitation that we have on the webinar today, uh, we are going to skip the Q&A session. However, we have seen more than 30 odd questions at the chatbot. And I would say that this is one of the most impressive webinar that I have attended or have spoken at because I see really quality Q&A question coming from the audience. And um, I would like to congratulate the audience for staying with us the entire afternoon and for putting up high quality questions. So what we're going to do right now is that we're going to jump right into the closing remarks for all speakers. However, all the speakers have been asked to read through all the questions that have been posted by audience and they will be responding to your questions in their closing remarks. So uh, may I now invite Dr. Maha to address the floor? So you have one and a half minutes for your closing remarks. 
Okay, so many questions, one and a half minutes, very quickly. So I hear permaculture. Permaculture is a, it's a very, I, I use the word romantic, it's a very romantic way of doing agriculture and I think it's, an, it's a healthy way, but how much can it really produce it's still a question. I would say we need all tools. We need all tools um, for farmers, breeders, scientists uh, to uh, produce uh, food. Then I also heard uh, incentives for urban farming. Where should it come? Whether it should come from private, public, from both sides. And government should support. Uh, we have uh, of, um, high level officers from DOA, MOA. Uh, government should support incentives for urban farming. And also the other one is like kitchen farming community farming, how can we also encourage that uh, people who are like say housewives and um, older people who are still fit. So we can also have uh, uh, things like this extension program is something that we need to revive. I think it was very good. Malaysia was doing very good. Now, I don't know how much of extension program is being done. There was a question from Cameron Highlands Green, um, where they are saying, how can we you uh, not, uh, how can we grow more in, in, the, in the limited land? Probably like what we say, we, we saw our speakers from Netherlands, high technology, precision agriculture. What we need is very good planting material, whether it is uh, stems or whether it's seed, we need very, very good planting material where it could be fast yielding and high yielding, uh, exhausting uh, resources, natural resources. Um, again, seed industry, seed uh, that can um, have give us more production in a smaller area, precision agriculture can help us with that. Now, one final thing I'm going to address very quickly, food safety, there was a question of food safety. What are the things in food safety when it comes to agriculture? It could be contaminants. We always see, you know, not always, but then sometimes Singapore rejecting our vegetables because of food safety, high level of chemicals, uh, pesticides. Now, in organic, um, uh, or, uh, organic um, agriculture, there are uh, risk of, um, heavy metals uh, because of the uh, non-chemical uh, controls use, heavy metals, E. coli, and then uh, that's that's also food safety in agriculture. And the, and, and one, another one is animal uh, droppings any, um, from, uh, uh, from rodents and uh, other things. So these are the food safety measures. There are regulations in the country. Malaysia have got regulations on this, and there are also international regulations that we need to abide with. So that is what I would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Maha. May I now invite Dr. Mohamed Dessa to address us? Please unmute. Dr. Dessa, please unmute your microphone. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, to, to see there is uh, many questions, means uh, many interested uh, parties to join this uh, webinar. And uh, maybe I can uh, raise some, uh, some uh, questions that maybe I will answer. Uh, in, in Brighton, in Britain. and then uh, the first regarding a food safety, this is one challenge for the farmers uh, in Malaysia. So that's the one expect to ensure that uh, the, there are practice good agriculture practice to ensure that uh, along with a good agriculture practice that to ensure that uh, food safety that we have a certification program we call that my gap and also my organic certification program in Malaysia now uh, the the major challenge is uh, to uh, to make a uh, Young farmers to involve in the culture sectors. That uh, we uh, try to uh, promote the uh, using the technology like IoT and also to become uh, one of the future farming in the in the Malaysia. And uh, these uh, kinds of technology can uh, add up more uh, practice in the good condition that uh, young farmers may be interested to join in the agriculture sectors. For the tropical fruits, maybe uh, this is one opportunity that uh, Malaysia have a good condition in terms of weather, soil very fertile and long years of rainfall patterns and this is a good opportunity for the farmers to join into production. So along with the system supply chains, we have to improve the facilities. Now we have uh, two um, uh, export facilities in uh, Serdang and also in uh, near Farm, the LIA airport that so we can use to, uh, to become a hub for the export uh, product in Malaysia to other countries. This is the opportunity that so we can uh, work together. So for the many questions I, I have uh, read, uh, before, so that uh, maybe we'll answer in the, because the time very constrained uh, for us. So maybe answer in written. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Dessa, for addressing this. Uh, may I now invite uh, Mr. Frederick? Yes, thank you very much. Well, I flicked through the questions and I'm trying to uh, send a reply to, uh, to some of them. I think the most important is maybe that the, the, um, the Dutch greenhouse model is not something that we are um, exp or that we 
consider it to be suitable or is maybe not that appropriate to import uh, or to, to, to copy it as it is. I think the most important takeaway should be that uh, we consider agriculture to be a, an entrepreneurial activity as a business and not as a default occupation. Uh, the greenhouse, uh, as I showed it, is maybe the Ferrari model, but I think there are all kinds of greenhouses or protected cultivation comes in various shapes and forms. And there are also uh, models which have a, a more adapted uh, technology level to local circumstances. So it's certainly not that you would have to look into a million dollar investments to, uh, to protect your, your crops from the, the climate and weather and insects. So uh, uh, do realize that there is uh, adapted uh, levels of technology. Thank you very much, Mr. Frederick. Well, I, I thought you have a lot more to share with us. Um, but well, yes, plenty of things, but you know, people might want to run uh, to uh, have to uh, uh, consider other activities. But uh, no, and I think the other th another aspect I think is the, uh, the the decrease of the use of pesticides because that's something uh, that is not only important for food safety but also for the environment. Uh, and I think these are maybe less costly investments that a farmer can take. Uh, it's of course easier to handle in a protected cultivation and in an orchard, for example, but I think for the agricultural sector um, as a whole, wherever um, it's, it's, it's active, the, um, the environment has, has become uh, really a topic, the climate has become uh, really a topic and decreasing in, uh, pesticides and other chemicals is a crucial thing we all have to put our shoulders under. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Last but not least, may I invite uh, Damien? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I'd like to conclude with actually an invitation. I think, uh, I hope that we could inspire you uh, what we can bring in knowledge and experience we already have from the Holland. Um, and I fully agree with Frederick. We, uh, we are here to cooperate and to customize uh, a model which fits Malaysia not a copycat which is duplicated all over the world because everywhere the market and the conditions are different uh, the perspective uh, we believe we feel is very important that we are developing an industry which fits a market model so whether it's the export or the local production uh, and only in that way you can make it sustainable also economically that you are doing the right solutions making the right decisions for the level of technology for the scale of the of the production levels uh, to make the right solutions to be implemented and also to be supported by the right policies um, so yeah we're open to cooperate um, we're happy to uh, to work with uh, malaysian partners uh, and also to bring in uh, very experienced dutch partners throughout the whole supply chain from seed to uh, packing and branding uh, to uh, to see where we can implement and uh, increase the success of Malaysia. Thank you for today. Thank you very much, Damien, for sharing with us. So in conclusion, I think what we have seen today, I mean, the examples and the success stories that were presented to us today clearly illustrates the impact that innovative technologies could have on food systems. The challenges that um, our Malaysian speakers have also presented can also definitely be solved when all parties collaborate and work together. However, whatever said, we all know that transforming food systems require interventions that go beyond technology innovation. So for example, creating new and bold policies that address the true cost of food systems could be one, establishing the infrastructure and investment that allow technology innovations to thrive, influencing consumer behaviors uh, with the help of technology and data, building trust and transparencies among the ecosystem or within the ecosystems, aligning towards common objectives and also collaborating across silos are all required to create the future that we want. So ladies and gentlemen, let's keep the conversation going offline or online, and we will definitely see you again in the near future. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and have a pleasant evening. However, before that, please do not leave the room yet as Marco is taking over. Thank you so much, Yin Sin. Um, you had a great uh, opportunity this afternoon with uh, four very experienced uh, speakers. Thank you so much to the two Malaysian and two Dutch speakers. Excellent combination. 
And thank you to Yinxin on behalf of the Netherlands Embassy and the MDBC. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying with us for the last two hours. We will close with the video again of Agri Malaysia in case you haven't seen it at the beginning. Please uh, stay online to watch it now. Uh, we will come back to you after this event, hopefully with um, the, the link to some presentation slides, the slide decks of the presenters, as well as some other information where you can go with future questions uh, with the Netherlands Embassy uh, connections. Thank you so much, all of you. And here comes the video again. Have a good evening. Thank you. This is my first time to be here, but it was very honored to be here and meet a lot of good people and had a good opportunity to start market in Malaysia. and very constructive. We're very happy to, to attend this event, which was organized perfectly by the team. So thank you very much. We will definitely come back next year. It's a wonderful place where you can meet a lot of customers, find a lot of possibility to cooperate.